Here we go. Yeah? Yep. Cool. Um, all right. Welcome. I assume we'll probably take a few minutes for people to, to hop in here. But uh, since this is getting recorded, I guess I'm just going to hop, hop right into it. Um, so, welcome to another virtual bike repair clinic with Bikes Not Bombs. I'm your friendly neighborhood bike mechanic. My name is Ben. And today we are talking about brakes, uh, brake systems on a bike, different types of brakes, and general information about cable systems, brake systems, and why they're important and how to fix them. So I'm going to jump right into this. The first uh, topic that I'm going to cover is what, what is a cable system? So the way I think of it is bicycles primarily have two types of systems on the bike. You have your rotational systems, which will probably be a class for another day. Those are all the things that allow the bike to spin so that the bike can, can roll. So you have your hubs, your bottom bracket, your headset, uh, all of that stuff. Cable systems are the mechanical systems on the bike that use a cable to perform different functions. So in this case, your brake systems are one of them. They allow you to stop the bike, which is pretty important. And then you have your shifting systems, which also use a cable. Nowadays, there are electronic shifters, but that's, that's a whole other thing. So the fact that it's a system means it's not one component. It's multiple components working together to produce a system that, func that serves a certain function on your bicycle. In the case of brake systems, for the most part, it's three components. You have a lever, some sort of point of contact that you put your hand on and you activate in order to initiate the braking. Then you have the mechanical cable that connects the brake lever to the brake caliper. And then the caliper itself is the actual device that causes friction on the wheel to slow it down. Uh, there are two main different types of braking contacts with the caliper. So either you can have a brake caliper that makes contact on the rim, or if it's a disc brake, which is the same type of brake that you have in a car or a motorcycle, the brake caliper is going to make contact with what's called a rotor, which is on your wheel, and that's what's going to cause the friction to slow your bike down and cause you to stop. So um, those are the cable systems. Why do we need brakes? Um, that should be pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but it's um, good to know that um, you, you need brakes, obviously, to, to stop your bike. Sometimes uh, it's not about stopping short, but just about controlling your, your speed as you're, as you're riding. And so it's a really good thing to practice uh, how, to, how to stop correctly and when to slam on your brakes and when to what's called feathering your brakes, which means um, slowing down uh, uh, just enough to control your speed so that you feel, you feel stable on your bike. And um, the, uh, the next big, big topic is um, what, what type of brakes are there? There's quite a few. And what type of brake do you need or what type of brake is appropriate for you or appropriate for the type of riding that you're doing or for the style of bike that you, that you have? So I can list off a few. I actually have some examples right here. So your standard road style brake is this guy right here. I have an example of a more, of a more classic one. And uh, the, this one's a little bit more modern. These are called side pole brakes. Uh, the reason they're called side pole brakes is because the cable comes down here on the side of the brake caliper. And so that's where your, your activation is happening. So the cable's on the side, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. So 
these are side pull brakes. Um, you have your uh, center pull brakes, similar to the side pull where the cable was on the side. Center pull brakes, which are becoming less and less common now, um, but here at Bike Snap Bombs, we deal with a lot of older bikes. We see these a lot. And um, this has a, a straddle wire, this piece right here, and it pulls, pulls right up from the middle like that. And then we have, so both of these are pretty common for, for road bikes. Then we have types of brakes that are more common on hybrids and uh, mountain bikes. These guys are called V-brakes. They come in two pieces, whereas the, the road bike calipers are more or less one, one piece. These are called V-brakes because when they're adjusted properly, they should be in a V shape. Another word for these are linear pull brakes. So similar to how the side pulls pull from the side, and the center pull brakes pull from the center, the linear pull brakes pull side to side. So the cable comes down and across and pulls this way. So V brakes, linear pull brakes, they, uh, they both refer to the, same, to the same thing. We did get a comment that it's a little quiet, so. Okay, I can, I can speak up. Um, also, give me one second. Hey Mario, there's, there's somebody at the door. All right, so another style of brake caliper. Uh, these are called cantilever brakes. These are also more commonly found on mountain bikes, hybrid bikes. Cantilever brakes, uh, and this is also true for, for the V-style brakes. They tend to have a little bit more stopping power than the side pull brakes or center pull brakes. So whereas these are more common for road bikes and these are common for mountain bikes, obviously stopping quickly and stopping when you need to stop is important for both style of brakes, but it's arguable that on a mountain bike, if you're flying down a mountain or a big hill, you really wanna, you're, you're really trusting that your brakes are gonna stop you the way they need to stop you. And because of the mechanical advantage and just the way these types of brakes are designed, they're going to give you more stopping force typically than you're going to experience with your, your standard road style side pull brakes. Both of these types of brakes are mounted on the brake post, which I have an example here of a fork that would accommodate this type of braking system. So both the V brakes and the cantilever brakes are mounted right here on the posts. You have one on each side. So if your bike has these posts, that means it's designed to accommodate these types of braking uh, calipers, these types of calipers. And if it's a road bike, most likely you're gonna have a fork that does not have the brake posts, but it has a hole drilled in what's called the crown of the fork and your brake is going to fit through the crown just like this. With side pull brakes, there is a front and a rear. The way you can tell the difference, especially for older style ones, is that the longer post here is gonna fit, so th this one's a rear, and I know that because it has a relatively short mounting post. On a front, which I believe this one would be, you can see that it's longer. The reason that it's longer is because it has to fit through the fork, whereas on the rear, it is mounted on, a, uh, on the brake bridge and it's a thinner piece of metal, so the post doesn't have to be as long. So that's a, a way to identify whether it's a front brake or a rear brake, specifically for the road style, the, the side pull brakes. So you can, you can potentially put a 
side pull break or a road break, there, you, you do have the drilling on this type of fork. Um, so that's not impossible. Actually, it might probably wouldn't fit on this one. But definitely good to know if what type of bike you have and what type of brake it takes. So those are more or less the standard. There's quite a few more. Obviously, I mentioned disc brakes. You have uh, coaster brakes, which you might be familiar with if you ever rode a bike as a kid. When you back pedal, it causes the wheel to lock up. Not to be confused with a fixed gear bicycle, where if you pedal backwards, the wheel actually spins backwards. On a usually a youth bike that has a coaster brake, when you pedal backwards, it means that the wheel locks up. There's an, an internal mechanism inside the hub that causes friction and slows the wheel down. S not too dissimilar from that are drum brakes. If you've ever ridden a blue bike in the city, then you've ridden a bike that has drum brakes. Similar mechanism where the friction is happening inside the hub of the wheel. You have rod brakes, which if you have a bike with rod brakes, it's probably from the 60s or earlier. So uh, if that's not the case for you, I would say don't, don't worry about that. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different type of, types of brakes. But for, for the average rider or for the entry level mechanic, for the most part, you're gonna encounter the road style side pull, the center pull, or the post style V-brakes, cantilever brakes, or if it's a fancy hybrid or a fancy mountain bike, you'll have the disc brakes with the disc caliper. Disc brakes are a little bit uh, more complicated, especially if they're hydraulic. So if anybody is interested in really learning a lot more about hydraulic disc brakes or mechanical disc brakes or hydraulics or anything like that, we can do a whole class just on that. So. Uh, stay tuned. Maybe maybe we'll set something like that up if there's enough interest. So uh, those are the types of brakes. And what type of brake do I need for my bike? So I sort of touched upon which type of bike takes which type of brake. There's also, in addition to the brake caliper, you also need to make a consideration on the brake lever. So if you remember earlier, I mentioned it's three parts. It's the caliper which is the piece of the brake that actually interfaces with the wheel and causes friction to slow it down with the brake, with the brake pads, which actually touch, which is the uh, piece that actually touches the wheel to create friction. You have the cable, which I'll talk about the cables in a moment. And then you have the brake lever. So the brake lever is going to mostly be determined by the type of handlebars that you have or that are appropriate for your bike. So I have two examples of the typical styles of handlebars, the two main flavors. You have the drop style handlebars, which are commonly used on road bikes, although I've seen all sorts of funky configurations of people mixing and matching different styles. But typically a road bike or a city bike, a commuter bike, will have the drop style handlebars. And alternatively, you have mountain bike style handlebars, which are either completely flat, or in this case, these are riser bars because they have a slight rise to them. And they come in different dimensions. Some rise a lot. If you have a chopper style bike, it might have eight hangers, which come up really high. If it's a cruiser style bike, they'll still be flat, but they'll curve towards you a little bit. Those are all in the family of this style of handlebar, which are more or less flat as opposed to drop bars, which are curved. So if you have drop bars, then you are going to need a road brake lever, something like this. And it's designed to mount right there. And this is really great when you're riding, especially if you're going long distances. Drop bars are perfect for riding longer distances because you can switch up your riding position. You can ride here, you can ride all the way down on the drops, or the curve of the brake lever is designed for you to comfortably lock your hand. And so you can ride like this and sort of hold yourself there and still reach the brake. So if you have drop bars, you're gonna need one of these. I'm sure some of you might have questions about 
interrupter levers or cyclocross levers. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of one of those here in front of me, but those are when you have the drop bars, but in addition to the road levers, you also have the mountain style levers. Something similar to this that mounts here. Oftentimes, people don't want to or don't feel comfortable leaning so far down that the, the drop bars sort of force you to be in a more aggressive riding position. They prefer riding up here and want to be able to activate their brakes without having to move here or here. So I would say if you have an older style bike that has the integrated road lever and sort of curved secondary lever, if you have one of these, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you adjust your brakes well enough, they can work. But a little PSA, they are known to cause problems because the secondary lever is just the way physics work. It's just not gonna have the same amount of stopping force that your primary, your, your road lever is gonna have. So if it's an old school one, I recommend either ditching them or if you're the kind of person who always, always, always rides here, I would say switch out your handlebars, which isn't the easiest thing to do in the world, but uh, I'd be happy to teach a lesson on sort of custom building or mix and matching or bike part swapping. So we can totally do something like that, or you can come by the shop and we can give you an estimate on what it would cost to do that. Or potentially buying a bike that fits you more comfortably if the one that you have now just doesn't really feel right. There's no shame in, in looking at alternative options that are more suited to the riding position you want to be in. There is a more modern example of the secondary lever that are common on cyclocross style bikes. And those, are, those work fine. They can totally be installed on a set of drop bars and they allow you to brake here and here. So that, that is totally a viable upgrade if you want to have both options. So moving along to the mountain bike style handlebars, you could also find these on a hybrid or on a BMX bike. Often we'll have steep risers with an extra bar. Any, any system that has a flat uh, section where you put your hands is going to have a mountain bike style lever that's designed to simply mount. It's a little tight, but basically mount right here with your grip and the lever being here. So it wouldn't really make a lot of sense to mount your road lever on this type of handlebars and vice versa with the mountain bike style levers on the drop bars. So it's good to know what type of bike you have, what style of bike you have, what type of handlebars you have, so you can know what type of brake lever is appropriate for you. So we touched upon the calipers and the levers that leaves the final component of the brake system, which is the cable. And it is a cable system, so it's pretty important that you have one of these and you understand the differences. So the cable is going to be mounted inside the lever. Every single cable is going to have a head at the end of it that acts as an anchor so that when you activate the brake lever, it's going to pull the cable. And that's how the brakes function. So the type of head that you have on the end here is going to be determined by the type of lever, brake lever, that you're using and you have on your bike. So this style that's sort of like a mushroom, this is going to be specifically designed to fit the road style drop bar brake lever. So these two go together. The mountain bike brake lever this style, which you can see the anchor here is a little bit more exposed, that is going to use its own style of cable. Pull, pull out from my, my desk, make all sorts of noise. So it's going to be a barrel that looks like it's rolled onto its side. So pretty, pretty clear difference between the two. So this is the style that's appropriate for road bikes with drop handlebars. 
this is the style that's appropriate for any bike that has a flat handlebar where you're going to use the mountain bike style brake lever. So these are the two. And then the third would be a shifter cable. For the most part, all shifter cables are, are more or less the same. And if we do a class on shifting systems, we'll talk about those kind of cables. So these are the cables. And then there's one more component that is crucial for your brakes that go in the cable or sort of connection category. And that's going to be the housing. So the housing, very important. I have a whole big roll of housing right here. I use quite a bit of it. Housing is basically a sheet of metal, some sort of alloy with a plastic casing around it. What the housing does is primarily two things. One is it's going to protect the cable and keep it clean for the most part, although water can get inside the housing, which can be a problem if you leave your bike out in the rain. The other thing, which is probably the most important, is that if you were to try to run your cable directly from the lever to the caliper, the cable is going to take the shortest distance possible, and it's going to become really taut, and if you try to turn your handlebars, it's going to get stuck. What the housing does is because it's rigid, it allows your cables to make graceful curves so that it doesn't end up getting pinched somewhere or scraping against something. So without the housing, it's really hard to set up your brakes or really have them function at all. So the housing is crucial. Brake housing and shifter housing are different. There's a pretty easy way to tell the difference Shift, uh, brake housing is pretty flexible and it's pretty springy. Inside of this plastic casing, the metal is coiled like a spring. That's because when you activate your brake and then you let go, you want the brakes to spring back open. So having the housing that is coiled like a spring is really useful for that, for that action. With shifting, it's the opposite. When you shift into a gear, you want it to stay in that gear and not move. So shifter housing is much more rigid. So if you ever get the opportunity to hold them side by side, you can feel how much more the brake housing flexes than the shifter housing. The shifter housing is also made up of a bunch of wires that are all stacked on top of each other vertically, which creates a much stiffer housing. And one quick side note, uh, just in terms of the vocabulary, is that uh, nobody's going to call you out on this unless, unless they're a jerk, but there is a difference between a cable and a wire, and uh, it's really impressive when you know the difference. So a cable is basically just a bunch of wires. So one individual wire coiled around a bunch of other wires is going to create what we call a cable. So uh, the housing has, um, I guess the housing, I guess shifter housing is a bunch of wires that sort of create a cable. Um, brake housing is sort of one continuous coil, but don't worry about the housing too much. Brake and shifter cables are cables because they're multiple wires wound together, which if you've ever had an old bike, you might notice at the end of the cable after years of riding, maybe not even years, maybe less than that, after getting some wear and tear, the wires might start to unwind from one another. Each individual wire is very thin and it can be really sharp if you touch it and, and can actually, you can cut yourself, I've, I've done that myself. So it's really important to put a metal tip on the end of your cable and in just a moment, I'm gonna do a quick demo on how to replace your cables and I'll show you how to crimp a tip on the end. But it's good to know that Brake cables are a bunch of wires that are wound together. So we talked about calipers, we talked about cables and housing, and we talked about levers. So now I'm gonna do a super quick uh, demonstration on how to switch out the uh, cables on your bike. So I'm gonna use this bike in this, as an example. I'm gonna throw this guy up on here. This bike is bike that we have for sale at our shop. Um, we, 
If you don't already know, we've been putting together an online store. If you go to bikesnotbombs.org and you click the bike shop tab, there's a link to our online store. And this bike is currently posted on there. So if you're looking for a cool, let's see, 53 centimeter single speed, we've got a good one for you. And it's about to get a brand new, fresh uh, cable job. So get them, get them while we got them. All right, so the reason you would want to switch out your cables are if they have become corroded or weathered. It's always a good idea to keep your bike dry and keep it out of the elements, but uh, for some of us, that's not always an option. And water can get inside the housing, water can get on the exposed sections of the cables and cause them to become rusty. The ends of the cables, if the tip is not installed or comes off while riding, can get frayed and start to unwind, like I just mentioned. So there's a bunch of reasons. Um, obviously, if your cables snap, then that's a, a, a pretty obvious reason to replace them. And something that doesn't get thought about as, as often is that there's a lot of things on the bike that are constantly under tension. So that's true for the spokes on your wheel, that's true for your chain, and it's true for your brakes. Every time you squeeze on the brakes, and even when you're not squeezing on them, they're under tension and it might not be obvious to your eyes in real time, but the cables are gonna be stretching out. When your chain stretches out, that can cause some serious issues with your shifting. It can cause the chain to slip off your gears. When your, the spokes on your wheel stretch out, that's what causes your wheel to become out of true, and that's when it starts wobbling side to side. And when your brake cables stretch out, that's when you're riding, you've been riding for a few months, and you start to feel like your brakes aren't, aren't as strong as they used to be, it's because as the cable stretches out, the brake pads, which contact the rim or con contact a rotor in the case of disc brakes, are moving further away from the rim because the cable is becoming more slack. So replacing your cables and starting fresh means you're starting with cables that are not stretched out yet. So it's really not a bad idea to replace all the cables and potentially the housing if it gets torn or kinked, but you can, you can repurpose housing for a bit longer because it's not under tension in the same way. But maybe, maybe once a year, maybe even more frequently if you're riding your bike a lot, and especially if you're riding it a lot in um, inclement weather, but it's really a great way to keep your bike running well and to keep your bike safe if you know your brakes are working because you've got fresh cables. So. In this case, I'm going to assume that on this bike, it's an old bike, so use your imagination, and I'm going to replace the cables. It's, it's about time. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, uh, and I haven't even talked about tools yet, so let's quickly do that. This is pretty self-explanatory. They are cable cutters. You use them for cutting cables. Uh, these are specifically designed for cutting cables. I wouldn't recommend using something like this. These are diagonal cutters. These will come into play at the end, but using cable cutters are the best way to make an easy, clean, clean cut. So if you're gonna do that, I, re I recommend using this tool. This is a particularly nice one that, that I have. And I am going to cut the end of my cable here. You can see there's a, there's a cable tip that's on it. I'm going to cut that tip off because if I don't, I won't be able to pull the cable out of the housing. So I'm gonna have to do that. So I'm gonna take this uh, little cable tip and I'm gonna put it off to the side. Then I'm going to take a set of Allen wrenches. You can use a uh, multi-tool like this. This is a Y-band one. You can use an L-band one like this, whatever you have access to. Um, I really like these part tool multi-tools because I can have it in my pocket and I know I'm gonna have most sizes that I need. And I'm going to disengage the anchor bolt. Um, and by the way, these are the side pull sort of city or road style brakes that I'm working on here. And I'm going to unhook by loosening with the five millimeter Allen wrench. I'm going to disengage the cable so it's now no longer under tension. And then I'm going to remove the cable and I'm going to take the housing off of the cable 
Uh, here's a pro tip. If I was going to replace the housing, which in this case I'm not because this housing is perfectly fine. There's no damage, there's no corrosion, it's not kinked or anything like that. So I'm not gonna replace this. But if I were to replace this, I would want to, assuming that it was cut to the correct length the first time, I'm gonna save this housing and then when I go to get more housing, I'm going to measure the two up to one another and cut it so that I don't have to then remeasure the housing because the length that you cut it is pretty important. You don't want it too short or too long. So it just saves you a little bit of time if you measure the new housing to the old housing. Although if whoever had the bike before you did it incorrectly and they didn't have the right length housing, it's good to be aware of that and then make adjustments with the new housing. So I'm gonna hold on to this, put it down on my bench then I'm going to remove the cable from the brake lever. So if you remember, these are the mountain bike style levers. We have riser bars on this bike. We've set it up to be sort of a not super aggressive, but not super laid back sort of city, city commuter style bike. So this part of the lever here is called the barrel adjuster. The barrel adjuster is really great because it allows you to put a little bit of extra tension on the cable to accommodate for the fact that the cable is going to stretch out over time. So when you first set up your brakes, it's crucial that you screw the barrel adjuster all the way in so that as you're riding it, you can incrementally unscrew it. But it and that might be a little counterintuitive, but when you screw it in, that means that it's putting no extra tension on the cable. As you unscrew it, what that's gonna do is it's actually going to increase the distance that the cable has to travel and therefore put a sort of a micro adjustment on the cable. If your brakes are really stretched out or the brake pads are really far from the rim, then you actually have to disengage the anchor and pull, physically pull the cable through further. But you can make minor adjustments by unscrewing the barrel adjuster. But I also have to unscrew the barrel adjuster to remove the cable because right now it's a continuous um, cylinder, but you can see here there's sort of a track that needs to get the lock nut and the barrel adjuster itself need to get lined up. And then those are gonna line up with the, with the cutout on the bottom of the lever. And then eventually when those all line up, I can pull the cable out from the this sort of anchor piece right here. So then I don't need this anymore. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of it, and I'm gonna grab my new cable. Which, if you remember, the cable that's appropriate for this type of lever is the one that's shaped like a barrel on the end. I'm going to set that back in my anchor here. I'm gonna slot it back in the groove. I'm gonna make sure this is still lined up, so it will go back in the barrel adjuster. I'm gonna screw my barrel adjuster all the way down, just like that. All right, so I've now reinstalled the cable. So when you're activating the brake, it's pulling on the cable, the housing remains stationary, and the cable moves inside of the housing, and that creates friction. So it's not a bad idea. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's a pretty good idea to put a little bit of grease on the cable so that it's not getting sort of slowed down or not producing too much friction inside of the housing which will make your brakes feel a little a little gross it won't feel as responsive as you want it to be so there's all sorts of different types of grease everybody has different preferences in this case i'm going to use some pretty standard uh park park tool grease here at the bike shop we have we buy it in bulk we have these large containers it does come with a, a brush applicator, which you can use. Obviously, I, I'm using my fingers. I can get a little bit more, I'm a little bit more dexterous with my fingers. You don't need a ton, just, just a little bit on the very end of the cable. You don't want globs, but just a little bit on the end of the cable. And the reason I'm putting it on the end is because this is the side that's gonna go back into the housing first. And it's as I pull the cable through, that's going to coat the inside of the housing completely. So that's gonna reduce some friction there and make the brakes feel a little bit better. Now, 
obviously I didn't cut the housing. If I were to cut a new length of housing, you want to make sure you get a really clean cut, especially with brake housing. It's really easy when you cut it to create a little burr uh, or a little tooth that can snag your, your cable and your brakes are not gonna work as well. So it's a great idea to have these diagonal cutters to snip a little piece, make it a nice, clean, flush cut. We actually have a, a, a bench grinder, a, a grind wheel here at the shop that we use and we actually grind down the ends of the housing to make sure they're, they're perfectly flush. So obviously if you don't have one in your home shop or your house, that's perfectly fine but it's a good thing to have these diagonal cutters to sort of clean up that cut. And then you're also gonna want these metal, what are called ferrules, at the, at the ends of your housing. Sometimes wherever you're mounting the housing, sort of at the end of the brake lever or at the point where it contacts your brake caliper, sometimes the ferrules aren't going to fit. Uh, that might mean that you need uh, a four millimeter ferrule, whereas these are typically five millimeters. Um, or sometimes it's just not going to fit and that's how it's designed. So don't, don't fret if you put the ferrule on and then it's not going in. Just take off the ferrule and put the housing in. So I've now greased the cable. The grease is going through the housing. I'm going to slide the housing all the way back to the ferrule adjuster here. Now, here's something that can trip you up. Um, do I put the housing in front of its neighbor or behind its neighbor? So you can see here I have the housing that goes to the back brake, the housing for the front brake. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter as long as the housing isn't getting pinched on itself or getting caught somewhere in a way that makes it so that when you turn the handlebars, it limits the amount of motion that you have or if it's affecting your brakes and, and forcing them to activate when you don't want them to. But the general rule of thumb is that you want whatever system is on front, so in this case we're working on the front brake, then I'm gonna put the housing in the back. If I was working on the rear brake, the back brake, the housing goes in front. So basically the housing in order from front to back is the opposite of the system that it's attached to. That's, that's a crazy sentence. But basically I'm working on the front brake and so my housing is gonna go in the back. It's the, it's the opposite. So there, there might be some mechanics there who, who would disagree with me, but that's, that's what I've been taught and I've never had any issues doing it that way. Um, so this is a single speed, which means it only has cable systems for brakes. It doesn't have shifters. So if you did have shifters, you'd have four cables and four sets of housing, one for front and rear brake and one for front and rear shifter. And then it gets even more complicated, but the rule still applies. If it's a system that's in the back, either the back, the rear derailleur or rear brake, the housing goes in front. If it's the front brake or front derailleur, the housing goes in the back. And it's really important not to do it like through the frame or route it over the stem unless there are some situations where that's appropriate. But for the most part, you want to keep the housing in front of the bike, in front of the handlebars, not coming in contact with anything and in this case, it's pretty straightforward. The length of the housing, a good rule of thumb, is it's too short if it's going straight from the barrel adjuster to the caliper. It's too long if it's coming way out here and going like that. If it's too long, it's possible that the, the loop might get caught on something or it might interfere with turning the handlebars, and that's definitely true. If it's too short, it might not allow you to turn the handlebars. It definitely takes some practice to cut the housing to the, light rank, to the right length. I would say reference other bikes. If you have a friend's bike or you go into a bike shop and you see other bikes, it's a really good way to see how, how long the, the housing should, should be. But as long as you can turn your handlebars still and the housing isn't so long it's getting caught on something, if it's an extra centimeter or an extra inch, uh, don't worry about it. All right, so we're coming, we're coming towards the end of this repair got my new cable, I'm routing it through, anchoring it down, and then I'm just going to have to put the cable back onto the anchor bolt, and then I get to use one of my favorite tools. So obviously 
So you can probably tell that I'm a human being. And because I'm a human being, I only have two hands. Um, and doing what I'm about to do often requires having extra help or extra hands. So there is a tool called a third hand tool. I don't use the third hand super often. It can be really useful in certain situations, but it's not something I use on a daily basis. However, the, excuse me, the fourth hand tool, this one, is super, super useful. You don't absolutely have to use this. You can set up your brakes without it, but the fourth hand tool is, is just the best for, for working on brakes. So if you're gonna work on brakes on your own, this is definitely a tool to get. This one in particular is made by Hosan. Uh, personally, I think the Hosan fourth hand tool is the best one that I've, that I've used so far. So the way this is gonna work is, now that the cable is set up here, you can see that the brake pad has maybe like a quarter inch of space from, from the outer edge of the pad and the brake surface of the rim. You want more or less to get the brake pad as close to the rim as possible without it actually touching. There are some situations where you might want to back it up a little bit, but in this case, I want it to be pretty close. Now, my wheel, this wheel is brand new and it's in true, meaning it spins in a straight line and doesn't wobble side to side, or, or at least it shouldn't. If your wheel, if your rim is super out of true and it's wobbling like, like crazy, moving side to side like a, like a fishtail, it's gonna be really, really hard to set up your brakes because your brakes might not touch in one spot, but if the rim is leaning to one side, you're gonna to have to set your brakes further away than that furthest point where the wheel is moving. So it's, it's, it's crucial that you set up your brakes after having trued your wheel, or if they're, new, if they're new wheels, they should be in true already. But setting up brakes with a wheel that's out of true is really, is really tricky. So um, keep, keep that in mind when you're setting up your brakes. So what I'm gonna do with the fourth hand tool is I'm going to line up the cable here with this groove. So you can see it, it sits right in there. This arm is gonna pinch the cable and then it's gonna use the spring and the lever to push up. So what that does, if I slide it all the way to my anchor bolt, is that's gonna pull the cable through. If you try to do that with your hand, it's, it's possible, but it's so much easier with the fourth hand tool. All right, so before I tighten this down, which is more or less the final step, um, I'll give you another pro tip. What you can do, instead of trying to eyeball it and see, okay, I want it maybe like a millimeter away or, or two millimeters away, what you can do is you can actually pull the cable just until the point where the brake pads actually make contact with the rim. So they're actually touching right now. And, oops, let's see, five, mil, five millimeters. So right now they're touching and I'm gonna get it nice and tight. It's really good to make sure your anchor bolt is tight because if you if it's not tight and you squeeze on the brake lever it's going to pull the the cable out so get that nice and tight right now the rim is rubbing on the wheel a little bit it's not as close as i thought it was going to be because i inadvertently uh relaxed my the muscles in my hand ever so slightly and so now it's now it's actually more or less perfect but for the sake of demonstrating this, this technique, imagine that the brake pads are, are right up against the rim. So, as, I, as I've mentioned earlier, the cable is going to stretch out. And it's going to stretch out the most right at the beginning. So imagine if there's a graph representing the way the cable is going to stretch. It's going to have a spike, and then it's going to kind of level out. So it's really good to pre-stress the cable. So, so putting a ton of force on the cable now because otherwise you can set up your brakes perfectly with a brand new cable and literally after the first ride, your brakes are gonna be super loose because that's when the most stretching is gonna happen. So what I do is I put the brake pads right up against the rim and then I just squeeze the heck out of the cable. I really put a lot of force on the lever. And because I put the brake pads right up against the rim, that's gonna put some slack into the cable and move them out, not a lot, but just enough so that now they should be more or less in the perfect 
perfect position. And because I made sure my anchor bolt is nice and tight, then I should be good to go. So I can spin the wheel, boom. And when I activate the brake lever, the brakes stop the bike. The brake pads make contact with the brake surface of the rim and the wheel stops. Now, we talked about replacing cables. Brake pads are made out of um, whatever sort of compound, rubber compound, uh, different brake pad manufacturers may have different formulas. Um, there are harder ones, which are typically the black color. Those don't grip the rim as well, but they last a lot longer. If you've ever seen the ones that are sort of an orange or salmon colored brake pads, typically it's a softer rubber formula that especially in wet weather conditions will, will grip the rim a little bit better. There's, there's even some um, that have two or three different compounds uh, in a stack. Uh, there's all sorts of different types of brake pads, but typically there's softer ones that, are, that grip the rim better, uh, and especially when it's raining, but they wear out faster because they're softer. And then these are sort of your standard ones that are a lot more rigid, a lot harder, and they don't wear out as fast, but they might not grip the rim quite as well as the softer ones. After a while of constantly over and over again, having your brake pads come in contact with the rim, the rim itself is actually gonna to start to wear down. And it's not gonna wear down perfectly even, it's gonna become concave a little bit. If you feel the side of your rim and you can really feel the curvature of the rim, that's a really good sign that it's time to replace your wheels. So that, that's something that takes quite a while, riding your bike quite frequently, but it's a really, really good idea if you're working on your brakes anyway, to just kind of feel the side of the brake surface and um, uh, make sure that it's not worn down. I've seen, I've seen the brake surface of the rim that were 10 years old actually s split in half. So it's a really good idea. If you're, if you're unsure, bring it to a bike mechanic, have them take a look at it. Um, and I can feel the energy of all of you watching at home asking, what if my brakes are squeaky? Squeaky brakes, those are the worst. Um, so what I might do is maybe I'll do an entire like 30 minute discussion on squeaky brakes because there's a lot we can talk about. So I'm happy to do a Q and A um, and we can talk about squeaky brakes. Uh, for the sake of this video, um, I am going to, uh, in just a minute, wrap things up. I just want to quickly mention that I'm going to snip the end of this cable. There's no perfect length to cut it at. You know, give yourself a little bit of room so that you can make adjustments in the future. If you cut it right here at the anchor, you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot. And if you cut it way too long, the cable might get trapped in your spokes. So somewhere kind of in the middle, you know, maybe an inch and a half, maybe two inches. That's perfectly fine. The uh, cables are both sort of halfway between being elastic and being plastic. So they'll spring back, but if you really push them hard enough, they'll sort of stay. So you can, you can kind of push them out of the way. And then I'm going to put that, that cable tip that I showed you earlier. I have a whole, I have a whole bottle of them. You can, you can buy them. You can buy a hundred of these in a bottle. Um, especially if you work at a bike shop, you're going to have that many. And let's see. I'm gonna put that on the end there and crimp it down. So I'm gonna use, diagonal cutters are really great for crimping because they don't have as much force as the cable cutters do because you don't wanna cut all the way through. You wanna crimp it so that it doesn't slide off. So I'm just gonna press, I'm not gonna to press too hard, but you can see now it's crimped on and it's not gonna slide off. So that's that and then, um, it's dawned on me I haven't even talked about adjusting the brakes either, which is making sure that the brake pad is, uh, that the brake caliper is, is centered. Um, there's a lot of different ways, different types of brakes. So the linear pole or V style brakes are adjusted certain ways. The uh, side pole brakes are just adjusted certain ways. So for the sake of this class, I'm gonna sort of leave it at that. I'm happy to uh, do the Q and A as I mentioned earlier. And then um, maybe sometime in the future we'll do a, we'll do a really in-depth uh, brake adjustment and I'll go over each type of brake and we can also talk about how to deal with uh, squeaky brakes. But uh, I hope all of you enjoyed that. I hope it was informative and I'm excited to answer some of your questions. Yeah, so 
One of them said, thanks for this info. We would love to learn about disc brakes. So there's interest in disc brake systems. Um, you spoke on how to properly maintain your brakes a little bit. We have a question from Allison. It says, how often should you replace brake pads and how do I know when I should replace them? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna be back in just a moment. I'm gonna grab a, a brake, a certain type of brake pad that you use for V-brakes. So I'm gonna go, I'll go grab one. <laughs> These are the type of brake pads that you would typically use for your V style. These are great because they actually have a wear line. Hopefully you can see that. There's a line. It's actually a raised uh, sort of bump on the side of the brake pad. And it actually says right here, wear line. So what that means is it's about halfway from the top of the brake pad here to where it meets the sort of plastic holder. So once you get to that point where about half of the material has been worn off, that's when Jaguar, the manufacturer, recommends replacing it. Um, you can also totally eyeball it. Uh, some, sometimes it might be really obvious if you adjust your brake pad too low or too high so that only half of it in this dimension is contacting the rim and the bottom half isn't, then it's going to wear down in sort of this, this crescent shape because only half of it is uh, experiencing friction. If that gets really bad, uh, that's a really good reason to replace your brake pads and then make sure that they're, the whole surface is contacting the rim. And uh, yeah, I would say sort of rule of thumb, about half the material or three quarters of the, of the material, if you've completely worn down all of the the sort of rubber compound and you can see the difference between the, the sort of brake pad holder and the actual braking rubber material itself. If there's no more gray left and you're, you'll, you'll get to the point where you have the plastic holder scraping your rim, uh, that's a pretty good time to replace your brake pads. But it, it can never hurt to replace them sooner before it becomes an issue. Um, than waiting until it's catastrophic and you have some failure out in the middle of nowhere. So uh, it depends on how sort of how much meat on the bones you have, but it's the kind of thing where you'll you'll get used to recognizing it when you see it once you've replaced a bunch of brake pads. But yeah, if you're lucky enough to have the kind that has the wear line, then uh, you don't even have to know; it'll tell you. And there's one more. It's multiple parts, so okay. I'm going to try and summarize. Sure. Um, they say that they have a normal city style bike and they're wondering if cable quality varies between bikes and if there's any brands you'd specifically recommend or stay away from. Yeah, um, I recommend getting, so th there are a bunch of brands, uh, Jaguar is one of them, SRAM and Shimano make their own cables, uh, there's, there's a few other brands out there and I... I haven't, if, if you're someone who's a professional bike racer or a professional race mechanic, you probably have some sort of brand allegiance or some opinions about a particular brand. I can say I've tried a few and I've never really noticed, oh, these, these cables feel so good or whatever. Obviously the quality of the, the brake caliper is really gonna make a difference. Low end brake calipers are just gonna feel like mud and whereas high end brake calipers are just gonna feel like butter. Um, so that makes a huge difference. I will say getting stainless steel cables uh, as opposed to any other material is a really good way to know that you're getting quality. So as, as long as they're stainless steel. Um, as far as the housing, there's, uh, we, this is Jaguar housing. This stuff is reliable. We, we use it for all of our bikes. Um, different cables and housing right out of the box will come with different uh, sort of oils or, or whatever to make them to make them slick and and so they're, they're sort of pre pre lubricated uh, that's all that's all great stuff I also I often find that that stuff wears down pretty quick and then you need to re, re grease them um, but yeah I don't I don't think there's any one particular brand that's you know the best cable 
it's sort of similar with inner tubes where there's a bunch of different brands that manufacture inner tubes, but for your standard inner tube, they're, they're all pretty similar. But for cables, stainless steel is the way to go. Okay. We have one more. It says, how and how often would you clean your brake pads? Yeah, so I would say cleaning, cleanliness is next to godliness, and that, uh, your bicycle is no exception. So cleaning the whole bike as often as you are willing, I, I would say, do it. Clean your bike every time you ride if, if, you're, if you're willing to, to make the effort. Um, so I would say any time that your, your brake pads get dirty, uh, clean them. Um, dirty brake pads, uh, both brake pads and the braking surface of the rim or the disc rotor is super, super important, both to make sure you increase friction because even, even just touching the rim, you're gonna leave the residue from the oil on your hands on the brake sur surface of the rim, and that may cause a reduction of the friction. The, the way brakes work is the brake pads hit the rim, and that friction slows it down. So any oils, uh, whether they're natural from your hands or cleaning solution, um, are, are no good. So cleaning your brake pads as often as possible, and especially if you ride in the rain, especially if you ride in the snow. You know, if you take your bike out on a beautiful day in the sun, and there's nothing making your brake pads dirty, you should be fine. Um, but uh, I would discourage you from taking a spray bottle if you're gonna clean your bike and just you know, spraying it all over because then you're gonna get that solution on the rims and that's a really good way to cause your brakes to start squeaking. Um, so uh, clean, clean brake pads and a clean rim and a clean bike. Uh, is super important and yeah, just, just do it as often as, as you're willing to do it. What would you clean the pads with? Um, so I would recommend cleaning them. I would, I would recommend just starting with a rag, uh, just, just a rag. Uh, if there's like actual globules of, of dirt caked on, just sort of brush it off. Um, one thing that's uh, really handy to use if, if it's a surface you don't want to contaminate is rubbing alcohol because it will act as a solvent and then evaporate very quickly. So things like um, this kind of stuff, this, this bike wash stuff, is great for cleaning dirty parts, but it, it really sticks around. Uh, so if you spray this onto the rim, even if you wipe it off, you're still gonna have some residue on the rim. So, uh, but rubbing alcohol, because it evaporates quickly, can be used as cleaner, and it won't, it'll, it'll go away. Um, there are other products, especially for disc brakes, which are really, really sensitive. Uh, disc brake rotors, any little bit of contamination can affect your braking, and they they are notorious for being super squeaky when they're not attended to. Um, so there are products that are specific for cleaning and disinfecting uh, uh, disc rotors. So that's that's sort of a whole a whole other thing. Um, one other thing I'll mention is that sandpaper is actually a really good thing to use on your rims, uh, or sorry, use on your brake pads because it'll add tooth to the surface, which means on a sort of microscopic level, it's gonna cause more, more of a sort of abrasive surface and that will increase friction. So after cleaning your brake pads, especially if they're squeaking, a good thing you can do is take a little bit of sandpaper and rub it on the, on the brake pad and that uh, is a really great way to uh, improve the performance. Yeah, I know sometimes the aluminum shards from the rim can get into the pads too, that's so true. it's good yeah. to check. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a really good thing to look out for. Uh, I think we have one more question. Is, this, is there a rule on how to position the pad in terms of where it makes contact with the rim, and should it just be centered? Yeah, um, so you definitely want it centered from, from top and bottom. Um, you want to make sure that the angle of the brake pad is, is level with the rim. You don't want it askew like this. So making sure that the entire surface of the brake pad is contacting just the rim, so not below, and if it's above, it might hit your tire, which is not a good thing. Um, there is the issue of toe, which is a mat in the, the wheel in profile. Um, rather than having the brake pads hit the rim completely flush, you can tow them in, meaning that the front of the brake pad hits first, and then the rest of the brake pad. That's a pretty common solution for squeaky brakes, um, and it may improve the function 
where they sort of work their way in rather than hitting all at once. On the side pull style brakes, in order to tow them in, oftentimes you need to actually put uh, a, a, a towing tool or an adjustable wrench on the arm that the brake pads are mounted to, to physically warp the metal so that the brake pads tilt in a little bit. Uh, it's really easy to do that with the uh, V-brakes because they're actually, they have crescent shaped washers that are curved to allow you to angle the, the, the nose of the brake pad in or out. So um, you want them completely flush with the rim, but you can play around with the, the pitch in, in this direction to get them to work as best as possible. And here's a really good example of a brake pad that's super worn down. And you can see it's not worn down uniformly. So whoever, whoever donated this to us uh, when they were using it hadn't, didn't have it adjusted appropriately. There's this burr here that must have been hanging below the brake surface of the rim. So good example of that. Cool. So uh, unless there are any other questions, that more or less wraps it up. Like I said earlier, brakes, there's a ton to talk about. Um, I am really good at, at talking and, and over talking, so we will definitely have more of these and uh, we can talk more about dealing with squeaky brakes. I can do a whole lesson on squeaky brakes. We can do a whole lesson on how to center and adjust brakes. Um, so stay tuned to that. There's, there's definitely more to come. And uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to email the shop or you can email gary at bikesnotbombs.org. And I'm also accepting feedback on the format of these videos. If you want us to, you know, address questions as they come or any setup changes, I'm happy to hear that and respond. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya.